Okay, so hi. Uh, my talk would be a bit more low level than most of the other talks. Uh, it's more about implementing stuff to do machine learning than algorithms and applied things to build a product. This kind of thing can be useful if you're doing research, if you're trying to build or adapt new models. Sometimes operations provided by existing frameworks like TensorFlow or Tiano just don't have everything you need and you might want to implement a new operation. That's kind of my job also. <laughs> Uh, so, a brief introduction to how and why the GPU works. Basically, when you uh, program something for the GPU, it will look a bit like uh, this code. Uh, here I have code for OpenCL and CUDA, which are the two major frameworks, even though CUDA is much more uh, used in practice because NVIDIA has a much larger market share. Uh, but this is the kind of thing you run on the GPU. Uh, both of these uh, kernels describe a very simple operation, just adding two vectors together and storing the result in a third one. Um, one thing to, that you have to pay attention to when you, that, that might not be uh, obvious here, is that uh, what a kernel is describing is only a single operation of a vector program. So you're basically describing a slice of, of the computation and then through API you will instruct the GPU to run that many, many times to actually affect the whole vector. Also for the rest of the presentation, I have a few kernels I'll show off and I'll use this unified notation which basically is sort of an abstraction layer over CUDA and OpenCL so that the APIs are upcycled away and we can program the kernels once and have them run on both. So, uh, as I've said, the kernel is describing only a single slice of the computation. Uh, and then when you instruct the GPU that you want to run this, you will uh, use a grid and a block. Uh, uh, the, yeah, you describe the grid size and the block size. Why isn't there only a single size? If you want to run the kernel 10,000 times, you could just say, well, run it 10,000 times and that's it. Uh, the difference between grid and blocks is that blocks can, uh, the threads in a block can synchronize with each other and sort of exchange data. Whereas the threads, uh, the blocks in the grid cannot synchronize or exchange data in any way uh, with each other because the blocks might run one after the other or maybe in parallel, maybe one after the other, that's not really sure, and the order in which the blocks run depends on the hardware and plenty of other factors, and nothing is, nothing is guaranteed at this point. So if you have some sort of algorithm which needs uh, the threads to talk to each other, maybe reduction or something like that, then you need to pay attention to how you divide blocks and grids. If the, your kernels or instances of computation don't need any synchronization with the outside because they only work on a single slice of the data and really don't care about everything else, then it, it kind of matters how you schedule things because it affects performance, but where you, the exact size of the blocks and the grid for you is not uh, as big as the deal. So, talking about scheduling and performance, I've made some measurements because uh, one of the things I will uh, go through this kernel is things you have to pay attention to to really get the performance from your kernels. And the first thing is scheduling. Uh, one thing that is kind of peculiar with threads on the GPU is that they're grouped into uh, what is called warps on NVIDIA hardware or wavefront on AMD hardware. And this is like a basic unit of threads that is indivisible and always runs at the same time. On NVIDIA hardware, it's units of 32, and on AMD hardware, it's 64. This may change in the future, but it hasn't yet. Uh, and here I have some timings on two different NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, the first two lines at the top are basically running, uh, basically doing this, the, the addition kernel on 1 to 32 million elements with 1 to 32 threads. As you can see, the timing is 
almost the same, uh, even though at the end of the line we're doing 30 time, 32 more times the work. Uh, this is because even when you say, I only want one thread, it's the GPU is basically ru still running 30, 32 threads and just have 31 of those sort of disabled so that they work but don't store results and don't affect things just so to respect its minimum unit of work. The other two lines uh, going down at the bottom are only working on one million mn and incrementing the number of threads working on those in parallel. So at the end, it's basically one, ter uh, one over 32 the time of work as the, uh, the time taken total as the first one where there's only one thread for the whole thing. Uh, other things to pay attention to scheduling. So if you stay within multiples of 32s to not have threads that work and don't do anything useful for you, uh, there are still variations into the size of the local blocks. Here you can see the block size of 32 is basically slower and all the other block size are more or less equal with a slight bump around 700 or so. Uh, this bump is due to a hardware constraint on these class of GPU because the architecture is not exactly the same but really similar. I didn't have access to really, really varied hardware to expose all of this. So yeah, but at the, po at the point where you get about 700 elements in a block, then a single block can fit uh, on a GPU compute unit because the compute unit have a limited amount of resources and have to fit a, the blocks fit into them. So if you have really small blocks, you can fit many, many blocks on a uh, single compute unit. And this enables the, the unit uh, to switch between blocks and maybe have better performance. So if you have larger blocks, you may only be able to s fit one or maybe just less of them, and you get a slightly higher total runtime. And next, if you have the optimal block size, there's still a matter of what the grid size you'll use. And here, <coughs> I modified the kernel so that no matter what the size of the grid you, you get, it will still run through the whole vector by looping if, ne if required. Um, and we can see here that if you say, I have a block size of basically whatever, and for the grid size, I take the remaining size of the vector, so depending on the block size you use, and say, okay, so, size of vector divided by grid size, uh, divided by block size, is, is my grid size. This is not the optimal strategy. That's represented by the one at the bottom of the uh, graph. So it's better in this case to have all the blocks uh, or kernel size work on more than one element by using a smaller global size. On this, this GPU, it appears to be more efficient. This is the kind of thing that's you can have sort of thumb rules to have reasonable performance about, but if you really care about getting the ultimate performance for your kernel, you need to actually perform timings and try out thing out to make sure this is the optimal thing. Uh, here, there's not much difference about the optimal point, but for the Titan X, the, the optimal point seems to be when the global size is about a fourth of the amount of work to do. And uh, for the 750, the optimal point is either uh, 1 over 16 or 1 over 32, the amount of work. So uh, why is this scheduling and everything kind of weird? Um, that's because CPU cores and GPU cores have different uh, ways of addressing uh, problems that can encounter during execution, such as latency fetching results from memory, and other such things. A modern CPU core usually has this, the amount, the space to store two threads worth of uh, data uh, current position of execution and registers and all the stuff you need to run and have a large cache to ensure that data that we require from the memory to actually execute is readily available and there also has complex uh, uh, hardware 
program, sort of, to predict the execution and try to see, oh, there's a branch, uh, will probably go this way, so let's try to see what data this stream of expansion requires and bring that into cache in advance. Whereas on the GPU, uh, the strategy is rather to have much more space to run threads and a smaller cache. And basically, when one thread blocks uh, because it needs access to data that is in memory, the execution switch to the next one. And then that one eventually will block, and then we switch to the next one, and so on and so on. And once we've gone through all the threads, more or less, then usually the first one has its data ready, and we can switch back to it and continue executing. Uh, because of that, the GPU doesn't have any branching prediction or other sort of thing like that, and the cache is rather small compared to a CPU core. Okay, so other things that can slow down the kernel is synchronous operations. Here, synchronous operations might be obvious if you just explicitly synchronize at some point because you need the results from the kernel. Or it can be other things in the API that are not really obvious that they synchronize. Uh, things that did surprise us when we were implementing uh, stuff on the GPU is that memory allocations on the GPU are actually uh, fully synchronous with regards to anything that's executing on the GPU. Uh, so if you allocate memory or free memory, it basically waits until everything you've queued before is executed and then does the operation and then you can do other work. This can slow down your execution and here there's only two instances of the kernel but if we remove the synchronization between them we still gain a bit of time and if you do much more, much more loops then you can get a much better time. So here's an example of the graph when we, I run the addition kernel in a loop and then synchronize at the beginning and at the end of the loop. Y-axis here is logarithmic, which is why it looks like a uh, s just a slope, but uh, it's actually three times slower when you synchronize between every operation, whether and if you just synchronize at the beginning and the end, then you get the much faster time. So, and this is consistent across any number of loops except one because then you just do one operation. Uh, so, trying to avoid blocking is a good way to get more performance. Uh, another thing in the kernel code that you might need to pay attention to is divergent code. Divergent is basically whenever there's a branching like an if or sometimes while and for because there's also conditional in these constructs. Uh, the divergent code is okay, you can't branch in, but you try. You have to pay attention to not branch uh, within a warp, that's the single unit of threads, because uh, all those 32 threads have to execute at the same point and execute basically the same instruction. They can't jump ahead or back with regard to the rest of the group. Uh, but since we can still write divergent code for a, a conditional code like this in our kernel, the compiler has a way to make it work, which is using predicates on threads. Uh, so basically, it will set the branch condition as a predicate and then execute both the, the true branch and the false branch with a predicate saying, uh, instructing the thread basically, if the predicate is false, it will still execute the code but not actually store results in memory or do or affect registers and things like that and if the code is true then it will store the results for real uh, so we can see here that with this branch it's actually easy, uh, with this if code it will actually execute both branch and as a result will be slower uh, here is an example of a divergent kernel that I'll show you some timing for. So basically for each index in a vector, it's either doing an addition or doing a, a more complex function that takes more time. And so in this timing here, the fast kernel is the just doing the addition all the time. The slow kernel is doing the more complex part all the time and the divergent kernel is the alternating between the two. The so, uh, dark green bar at the bottom is just the overhead of launching a kernel, and the bright green at the top is the actual compute time of those kernels. 
And as you might see, the divergent kernel code uh, takes as much time as the slow plus the fast kernel together it's because it's executing all the instruction and all the branches. Uh, finally, another trick that can improve performance uh, when, uh, when you have memory that's laid out in a weird way, maybe, um, because uh, kernel access like the memory access to be contiguous with all threads, but this requires you that your data is laid out in a proper way. Sometimes it's easy to do because you control the data, you control the layout. Other times it's less easy and you can do things in the kernel and with scheduling to improve this. So this example is a kernel that's doing, once again, addition. I have macros that abstract reading from A and B because now these are not vectors, these are matrices and they can be C or Fortran order depending on uh, the inputs. The C matrix for the result will always be C order in this case. So that was the simple code, which is just doing a read from A and B, additioning and storing in C. And I have a more complex code, which is using tiling uh, to load the kernel, to load the data uh, in a continuous matter, no matter when it's C or Fortran order, by using uh, switching the, the way it's loading data into shared memory, which is kind of a cache on the GPU that you control yourself and you can store data that you decide in because it's used for your kernel. Um, and then I'm doing a loop and the kernel code here is just because there's too much code and it's on the next slide. So inside the, the loops, I have these uh, first two fours which are loading uh, the data into the buffers. This is actually the Fortran version, but there's also a, a C version. You need to have both versions of the kernel. Then there's a local barrier because uh, this is a synchronization point. Basically, as I said, all of these threads that are loading need to be in the same block because this, the shared memory is shared amongst threads in a block. Uh, and the local barrier is saying, wait until all the threads have written their stuff so that we can read it later. Uh, we need to take care of uh, memory synchronization when there's interaction across threads like this. Uh, and after that, the two or, uh, the other two for loop uh, embedded for loops are just taking the two shared memory tiles and adding all the things and storing into the the results into the C matrix. Timings for those. Uh, the first simple kernel is in yellow. Is if you have C order matrices, you get a time which is reasonable. If you have Fortran order matrices and just use the simple kernel again, then you get about more than twice as slow uh, execution time. But if you take the same kernel with the same inputs and tweak the scheduling a bit with ex some experimentation, you can get a result that's close to the original. It's still slower, but it's close. However, if you check the approach with the shared memory and the tiling, then you can get a much faster result. Even with just C order, the tiny red bar that's barely visible is using the shared memory tiling the, from the previous kernel, and the slightly bigger green bar is with Fortran order and shared memory tiling. Um, all of this is possible because we uh, the shared memory is much faster to read and write from inside from inside a thread. Uh, 